My kingdom for a horse, cried Richard III in Shakespeare's famous drama. Horses have played an important part in history, both in work and recreation. What is the nature of this beautiful animal? And why are we so fascinated by horses? I'm Tina Kuntz, and in this series, we'll explore the answer to those questions and more. Can I hear you say yes, Lord? Yes. Come on now. We will ride. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Why am I holding a glass of water in my hand? Well, it's to illustrate the smoothness of the ride of the wonderful Tennessee Rocking Horse. Hello, welcome to Come Ride With Me, and I'm Tina Kuntz. Today, as we look at this wonderful horse, we're going to be taking a visit with a Tennessee Walking Horse breeder, Dwayne West. Now, Dwayne also happens to be a member of the famous Jordanaires singing group. They have sung on dozens of hit records. They've also harmonized with Elvis in concerts and movies and all kinds of recordings. We'll be taking a visit to the Sand Creek Farm in near Nashville, Tennessee, which raises champion Tennessee walkers. We'll be going to the Village Blacksmith. We'll be taking a humorous look at horses in horseplay, and we'll be looking at what the Bible has to say about horses. Come ride with me. Gray and his wife Patty operate Sandy Creek Farm in Shelbyville, Tennessee. It's a beautiful and extraordinary farm. Uh, Tim, would you uh, tell us a little bit about the, the, this farm? Well, what, what do you uh, do here? Well, it's family operated. Me and my dad, we do the training of the horses. We run a training, breeding, and sale division. Uh, my wife, she manages the breeding stallions and runs the breeding part of it. And my mother, uh, she's the office. Uh, I guess the head lady. It's a, a fam family operation. <laughs> yes, ma'am. But now you are one of the largest farms in uh, the country. Yes, ma'am. And you deal with a particular type of horse. With the Tennessee Walker. Uh-huh. Uh, we raise them. It's, uh, it's kind of special when you see one that, that your wife has bred the mare and you raise the colt and then from her end down to my end to the training part and, and you see that young colt progress on into a champion. It, it's kind of a little special there. When well, it certainly would be. Now, you deal with breeding, training, and sales here, right? What we do is just like uh, you have uh, people that with their juveniles, which is a rider 17 and under, uh, your walking horse industry is, is really right now, our amateurs and juveniles uh, is what really makes it boom right now because it's, it's a family type uh, environment. You. Uh, you don't have to wonder where your child is if you've got him at the horse show that weekend. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of, uh, you know, right now what the backbone of the industry. What is so different about the Tennessee Walker that's from other horses? Well, your Walker originated years ago as a, uh, for your plantation owners, a good smooth riding horse to be able to ride and go over the farm and have a comfortable ride all day and not be give out. Uh, when he got through that day, and the uh, the Walker is uh, comes from your standard bread and your Morgan and your saddle bread crossed together over well we'll say 80 to 90 years of breeding, and to have what we have today the horse that we have today to show with your uh, Walker we want to go with style and grace and rhythm and timing, not with speed. It's uh, a lot like your saddlebred horse, that uh, the walk trot type horse, except he's got the, the smooth gait that comes from the pacer, the offside stride. Okay, are there special training techniques for, for walkers? Well, we start our uh, young horses when they're about 16 or 18 months old, and we start breaking them just like you would any type of colt, uh, you know, on the ground, hand working him, riding him, putting him to the sulkies, driving him, uh, doing both. And then you just uh, kind of like you would, uh, well, your show horse is an athlete, to just put it shortly. It's just like you do a top athlete. You kind of progress him up the ladder 
a little bit at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, what are those unusual things on the front legs of the walkers? Are, are they weights or what? No, ma'am, what we're going on is uh, they're made out of plastic and leather. Uh, and we want to go with uh, different degrees, with lengths and angles, which uh, we are under a uh, 1970 Horse Protection Act of rules and regulations, which uh, we have what you call a heel and toe measurement, which uh, that animal, show horse, has to be standing on his package just as if uh, he was standing flat on level ground. Uh, and we want the horse to be able to to uh, break off the ground, roll towards his shoulder, and extend. Kind of like uh, like if a cat or a dog was to step on a piece of tape. Want to mm -hmm. kind of pop it off the ground and that way with it. Uh, tell us about some of the awards that, that you've won with your, with your horses. Uh, well, we have, me and my father together have, we've won every division that can be won at the celebration several times. Uh, <laughs> You say that so casually. Well, <laughs> we've uh, we've been very blessed. You know, the Lord has uh, blessed us very well with uh, the talents that He's given me and my dad together, and the uh, opportunity of the horses that He's blessed us with. And we, um, my father and I, have in the walking horse industry are, are kind of well known for taking young horses from from colts up and, and progressing on up the ladder and, and going through the uh, process of making world grand champions out of them. And my dad has won the uh, world grand championship three times on three different horses. Uh, two of them we had from colts. Uh, let's see, myself, I've won quite a few of them too, so <laughs> we've... Uh, we're very blessed with, with uh, what the Lord has given us today to work with. Yeah, well, now you say that so humbly. What is it that makes a champion? Well, that desire in that horse's heart, I think. Has to be kind of born in him? Or? Yes, ma'am. You can, uh, you can kind of look in their eye and in their ways and, and tell. They're just like, uh, they're like me or you. They have attitudes and they have... Uh, you know, they get stressed or they get depressed, and, and you can see it, but you can see there's always that really, really exceptional horse that's going to be a great one. You can always tell in, in his actions, in his eyes, in his, just in the way he acts around the farm, the way he acts when you work with him, his, his intelligence level. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, I guess you could say he's like a Michael Jordan. I mean, Michael there's just, Gooden. yes, yeah, okay. ma'am, there's yeah. just that little special extra yeah. that he or she has that the others don't. Well, now, if you were going to look for an, just a nice all-around family horse, what, what characteristics would you look for? Uh, in my walker, you want, first of all, you want a very good temperament. You want him to wear, if, uh, if I had a job and I couldn't ride him but two or three days a week, I would want him to wear, uh, I could be easy to fool with, easy to catch, easy to handle, uh, no bad habits like in wanting to kick or or bite or uh, lead you instead of you leading yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and second, you want a you want a very good smooth gait, good easy gait with a lot of rhythm, uh, a lot of smoothness to him. Okay. Your uh, your walker, if you was to put well, comparison of a walker to a quarter horse. Uh, if you rode the walker all day and I rode the quarter horse, <laughs> I would envy you at the end of the day I, because I, you'd I have the smooth ride and I wouldn't. Yes. So. Now you are involved in the Fellowship of Christian Horse Lovers. Tell us about that. Yes, ma'am. About uh, three years ago, uh, there were several of us that kind of got together that uh, we thought that the walking horse industry was, uh, there was a calling for a uh, uh, Christ for God in it. Uh, you know, the industry had uh, kind of been, I guess you could say, uh, a lot of it was like uh, they're outlaws or they're this or that, uh, but they're no different than anybody else. We're all, a lot of people were searching for something and to fill that empty void, let's fill it with God. And uh, 
the uh, organization today is uh, we're trying to not build an organization but trying to fill God's kingdom. Uh, with uh, We've been uh, very fortunate that through the fellowship there has been half a dozen or so within the past three years that have been led to Christ. Uh, young men and women that, uh, you know, we were the closest thing to, uh, to Jesus that they had ever uh, been associated with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, today we did a study through our fellowship with uh, uh, Christ in your business. And until I did that study, had never managed my business as uh, it being the Lord's business. And it, uh, it made a 360 degree turnaround when, uh, when we turned everything over to, to the Lord. This is yours, not mine. And you've given me the opportunity to steward and minister through it. And you know, every time before we show and, and after we have our shows, we have a prayer time with our customers and, and owners. And uh, I always, whether we win or lose, ask the Lord to let us glorify Him. And I think if you, in defeat, uh, you know, everybody takes victory real well, yeah, yeah. but not everyone takes defeat real well. And I feel like that when you uh, have your defeat, that gives you even a stronger time to be able to glorify the Lord because the people on the outside are going to be looking at you. Mm -hmm. Well, how is He going to act about this? Is He going to stomp and kick and hoot and holler? Uh, and you know, there's always going to be another show, and, and I always glorify the Lord with everything you do. really one of God's most marvelous creatures. You can hear such a wonderful... Hello, hello there. How you doing? Well, folks, it seems like we have a real-life cowboy with us today. And your name, sir? My name is Dusty, Dusty Trailblazer. <laughs> well, hello, Dusty. And uh, what's your horse's name? My horse's name is Reverse. His name is Reverse? His name is Reverse. You named your horse Reverse? But, Mr. Cameraman, can you get a picture of my horse? <laughs> Isn't that a little unusual? Well, yes, it is, but you see the trainer, he was a little backwards. <laughs> What's that? Well, that's reverse. He's spitting cotton balls. We've been on a long trail ride. Can, can I get some water off of you? Hey, sure. There's some. Thank you. <laughs> Here you go, reverse. All right, I got him a drink there. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Oh, oh, reverse. He wants bottled water. <laughs> Do you have any bottled water? Here, I'll get some. I brought some. You see, Tina, me and Reverse, we've been trail riding for quite a while now. Well, how long have you been riding? We've been out on the trail for about seven days. And how far did you travel? Well, we've we've traveled four miles. But but I love horses, and I'm I'm a horse person. I'll tell you. Hi, I'm Mike Cothran. I'm a blacksmith from Franklin, Tennessee. Blacksmiths, or farriers as they're commonly called, primarily shoe horses for a living, and that's what I do. Today we're going to talk about why we shoe horses. Horses' hooves grow just like the human fingernail. And to illustrate this, we must compare the human anatomy to the horse. We know that our fingernails grow at a fairly common rate, so we have to trim our nails occasionally or they get too long and break off into the quick. As with a horse, the hoof grows at a, as a, at a relative rate of speed at a, at a rate of about a quarter to half an inch every six weeks. This extra growth of hoof affords the horse protection from the surfaces or the terrain that he's traveling over. With the wild horse, like the Mustang in the desert southwest, the hoof grows at about the same rate of speed that it's being worn away. This, again, affords the horse protection. But when we took the horse out of the wild and domesticated him and started to use him for 
uh, work in the fields and pulling wagons and things like this in the, around the 1800s, we started to have problems with hoof wearing away too quickly. Now the Roman Empire uh, over 2,000 years ago discovered this problem and they had to come up with a way to protect the bottom of the horse's foot because they had a lot of sore horses that couldn't travel over terrain and move their equipment around. The first horseshoes were initially made of wood, but they didn't stay on too well. We said that the hoof grows at a rate of a quarter to half an inch every six weeks. Well, this extra overgrowth of hoof uh, allowed one of the Roman blacksmiths to discover the fact that you could punch a hole in the hoof wall the same way we trim our fingernails and not feel any pain because the hoof wall is essentially dead material. When we look at the hoof, we see that it's essentially a capsule. We call it the hoof capsule. The hoof wall varies in thickness from a quarter to half an inch, depending on the breed of the animal and the age of the animal. So the Roman blacksmiths discovered that they could make a, a semicircle type of, of piece of iron and punch holes in it and attach it to this hoof wall with nails without making the horse lame, without him feeling any pain. And this afforded the horse protection from all types of terrain. Now we said that the hoof grows out and at a fairly common rate of speed, so as the hoof grew out too long, then the hooves had to be trimmed and the shoes had to be reset. This is one of the reasons we shoe horses. how you define a horse person. You know you're a horse person when your horse gets shoes more often than you do. <laughs> or you know you're a horse person when you kiss your horse more often than you do your wife and you enjoy it more. <laughs> you know you're a horse person when you consider moving to the barn because it's a lot cleaner. <laughs> and you also know you're a horse person if you find a human hair in your food and it makes you gag, but a horse hair goes down just fine. <laughs> you know you're a horse person, though. This is the main one, when you know you can find your boots in the dark by just the aroma. <laughs> that tells you you're a horse person. Well, Dusty, you seem to have a good time riding. Uh, do you ever have a bad riding day? Oh, yes, Tina. You know it's going to be a bad riding day when you go to your horse barn and the horses are wearing helmets. <laughs> Well, Dusty, I hear you're a good trainer. You actually have trained a horse not to eat? Yes, I trained my horse not to eat. But you know, the bad thing is I just got him trained not to eat, and he went up and died on me. <laughs> but you, um, you've done some training on gates, too, right? Yes, I've got old Reverse here. He's a five-gated horse. Reverse, yes, a five-gated horse. Start, stop, stumble, stagger, and fall. He can do all five of them. <laughs> For over 20 years, our special guest was a breeder and trainer of award-winning Tennessee walking horses. That is, whenever he wasn't on a stage, singing as a member of the world-famous Jordanaires Quartet. Dwayne West, welcome to our Thank program. You. Good to be here. <laughs> yeah. The Jordanaires is a very famous group. Tell us about that. The Jordanaires have been known basically as a backup group for all the artists in Nashville, and not only in Nashville, around the world. Um, They've been doing this since the early 50s and, of course, are famous for working with Elvis from 56 through 70. And as near as they can figure in the books that they're putting together, we've recorded behind over 4,000 artists. Oh, my. And been on probably 20 billion sales uh -huh. as background singers. It's been a great job and uh, met a lot of wonderful people. Uh, how did you get into the breeding Tennessee Walkers? Back in the mid '60s, a friend, of, well, two friends of mine in Nashville, asked me if I wanted to come to the celebration. I said yes. Came down, I fell in love with them immediately. And uh, in '70, I bought a farm in Nashville. And uh, first thing I bought after that was a, a broodmare, and started raising colts. And uh, by the time uh, I'd been in it 10 or 15 years, I had about 25 head. And, and uh, I almost became a full-time job. Had my own breeding stallion and uh, loved it dearly. 
Yeah, and I did that until about three years ago, and then with some physical problems, I just couldn't take care of it anymore. So I've sold my farm now, and I'm just enjoying the horse shows when I can. Yeah. Well, now, did you actually do the training yourself, or did someone do it for you? I would break the coats, but when it came uh, time for them to be put under saddle, I would bring them to a trainer down here in Shelbyville. Yeah. 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 What is so special about the Tennessee Walker? It's the smoothest ride you can have on a horse. You just sit still and they glide along. Uh -huh. and, uh, and they're just absolutely breathtaking. They're gorgeous. You'll see in a little bit. He's going to ride one for you, I think, in a little while. Yeah. And uh, their beauty is just unbelievable. And their temperament. They're very gentle, very loving animals. And. Uh, my favorite part was raising the babies. I love the baby coats. Thank you so much for being with us, Thank Wayne. Thanks for having me. I've for, enjoyed it. For taking the time, time to be with us, and we trust that things will go well as the Jordanaires continue blessing people all over the world. Thank you. Thanks. Experience. Yes, I did. I had a near-death experience. I'll tell you, it was, I was horseback riding the other day, and I had an experience that's changed my life forever. I was horseback riding, and everything was going fine, and then all of a sudden, my horse started bucking and bronking out of control. He started <laughs> bouncing all over the place, and I tried with all my might to hang on, but I couldn't do it. And just as I was getting ready to fall off, my foot got hung in the stirrups. And when it did, I fell and I hit my head, and my head just kept bouncing on the ground. And I, the horse didn't let up at all. He just kept going. And just when I was about to lose consciousness and give up all hope for life, the Walmart manager came out and unplugged it. Thank goodness for heroes. Well, Tina, I got to go. So I'll sing you a little song here. Bye, Dusty. We're happy trails to you until I can sit down again. Happy trails to you. My pants are wearing mighty thin. We go down the trail singing like some songbirds. Who cares that we are going backwards? Happy trails to you until we meet again. Well, come on, Rebirth. Here we go. Bye, Tina. Proper care of the hoof involves a joint venture between the owner, the veterinarian, and the farrier. A hoof that is properly trimmed, properly cleaned out has a much less risk of becoming infected or developing foot problems. Navicular disease, um, hoof cracks, um, fetlock problems, we've all seen these time and time again. The infections you will see in the foot most commonly thrush, is actually caused by a bacteria that thrives in wet, moist conditions. This will often be seen in stalls which are improperly cleaned, in horses that are worked and then put up without proper cleaning out of, of the foot. All that debris that sets itself inside that hoof will create just ideal breeding grounds for these bacteria. Once that infection's in there, it can be very, very difficult to remove it will create a situation where foot baths are important, where daily cleanings, many medications. So here again, as in most of the things we talk about, prevention is the key. Keep those hooves clean. Talk to your farrier. If your horse has certain problems, he can actually trim that hoof so that the stress is decreased on the problem area. Subsolar abscesses can be cleaned out. If a horse were to step on something, puncture the hoof, um, that, that place may easily get infected and abscess up. Okay, we call that a subsolar abscess, but it's no different from getting a splinter in your hand. Until you actually remove that splinter and the infection that goes along with it, it will always hurt. Another problem situation arises in, with winter traction devices. It's icy and slick out. We want our horse to get a better footing. We place special shoes on the horse. This will actually change the stresses for the hoof and the leg itself. 
and may cause problems there. It's very important to check with your farrier before you change your shoes on your horse. Like everything, an ounce of prevention beats a trip to the vet any day. Well, that's our program for today on the wonderful Tennessee Walking Horse. If this program has been a blessing to you, won't you write to us, let us know, write to TCT, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. Thanks for being with us today on Come Ride With Me.